Chapter Six of In the Sweet Dry and Dry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the Sweet Dry and Dry by Christopher Morley and Bart Haley. Chapter Six Departed Spirits. If Bishop Chuff desired to make people stop thinking about alcohol, his plan of seizing them and shutting them up in the grounds of the federal home at canna was a quaint way of attaining this purpose for all the victims who had been suddenly arrested in the course of their daily concerns accused before a rum-head court-martial of harboring illicit alcoholic desires and driven over to canna in crowded motor trucks now had very little else to brood about in the golden light and fragrance of a summer afternoon here they were surrounded by all the apparatus to restrain alcoholic excess and not even the slightest exhilaration of spirit to justify the depressing scene it was annoying to see frequent notices such as this entrance for brandy topers or vodka patients in this ward or inmates must not bite off the doorknobs it seemed carrying a jest too far when these citizens most of whom had not even smelt a drink in two years found themselves billeted into padded cells and confronted by rows of straitjackets. Moreover, the home had lain unused for many months. It was dusty, dilapidated, and of a moldy savor. Some of the unwilling visitors, finding that the grounds included a strip of sandy beach, took their ordeal with reasonable philosophy. "'Since we are to be slaves,' they said, "'at least let's have some surf bathing.' And donning, with a shudder, the rather gruesome padded bathing suits they found in the lockers. They went off for a swim. Others, of a humorous turn, derived a certain rudimentary amusement in studying the garden marked reserved for patients, with insane delusions, where they found a very excellent relief model of the battleground of the Marne, laid out by a former inmate who had imagined himself to be General Joffre. But most of them stood about in groups, talking bitterly. Quimbleton, therefore, found a receptive audience for his Spartacus scheme of organizing this band of downtrodden victims into a fighting force. He gathered them into the dining hall of the home and addressed them in spirited language. "'My friends,' he said, "'unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, I feel it my duty to administer a few remarks on the subject of our present situation.' and the first thought that comes to my mind candidly is this that we must give bishop chuff credit for a quality we never imagined him to possess that quality gentlemen is a sense of humour i hear some dissent and yet it seems to me to be somewhat humorous that this gathering composed of men who were accustomed in the good old days to carry their liquor like gentlemen should now when they have been cold sober for two years be incarcerated in this humiliating place surrounded by the morbid relics of those waker souls who found their grog too strong for them i say therefore that we must give bishop chuff credit for a sense of humour it makes him all the more deadly enemy yet i think we will have the laugh on him yet in a manner i shall presently describe for the bishop has what may be dominated a single-tracked mind he undoubtedly imagines that we will submit tamely to this outrage he has surrounded us with guards he expects us to be meek in my experience the meek inherit the dearth let us not be meek there was a shout of applause and quimbleton's salient of horsehair beard waved triumphantly as he gathered strength his burly figure in the lilac upholstering dominated the audience. He went on. And what is our crime? That we have nourished in the privacy of our own intellects treasonable thoughts or desires concerning alcohol? Gentlemen, it is the first principle of common law that a man cannot be indicted for thinking a crime. There must be some overt act, some evidence of illegal intention, can a man be deprived of freedom for carrying concealed thoughts? If so, we might as well abolish the human mind itself, which Bishop Chuff and his flunkies would gladly do. I doubt not, for they themselves would lose nothing thereby. Vigorous clapping greeted this sally. Now, gentlemen, 
cried Quimbleton, though we follow a lost cause, and even though the gooseberry and the raisin and the apple be doomed, let us see it through with gallantry. The enemy has mobilized dreadful engines of war against us. Let us retort in kind. He has tanks in the field. Let us retort with tankards. They tell me there is a warship in the offing to shell us into submission. Very well. If he has gobs, let us retort with goblets. If he has deacons, let us parry him with decanters. Chuff has put us here under the pretext of being drunk. Very well. Then let us be drunk. Let us go down in our cups, not in our saucers. Where there's a swill, there's a way. Let us be sought in our ways, he added, sort of a che. Terrific uproar followed this fine outburst. Quimbleton had to calm the frenzy by gesturing for silence. I hear some natural queries, he said. Someone asks how. To this I shall presently explain. Here's how. Bear with me a moment. My friends, it would be idle for us to attempt the great task before us, relying merely on ourselves. In such great crises, it is necessary to call upon a higher power for strength and succor. This is no mere brawl, no haphazard scuffle. It is the battleground. If I were jocosely minded, I might say it is the bottle ground of a great principle. If, gentlemen, I wished to harrow your souls, I would ask you to hark back in memory to the fine old days when brave men and lovely women sat down at the same table with a glass of wine or a mug of ale and no one thought any the worse i would ask you to remember the color of the wine in the goblet how it caught the light how merrily it tinkled with beaded bubbles winking at the brim as some poet has observed if i wanted to harrow you gentlemen i would recall to you little tables little round tables set out under the trees on the lawn of some country inn where the enchanting music of harp and fiddle twangled on the summer air where great bowls of punch chimed gently as the lumps of ice knocked on the thin crystal the little tables were spread tinder the trees and then later on perhaps the customers were spread under the tables i would ask you to recall the manly sail of dark beer as you knew it the bitter chill of it as it went down the simple felicity it induced in the care-burdened mind i could quote to you poet after poet who has nourished his song upon honest malt liquor i need only think of mr macefield who has put these manly words in the mouth of his pirate mate oh some are fond of spanish wine and some are fond of french and some swallow tea and stuff fit only for a wench but i'm for right jamaica till i roll beneath the bench O oh, some are fond of fiddles, and a song well sung, And some are all for music, for to lilt upon the tongue, But mouths were made for tankards, and for sucking at the bung. This apparently artless oratory was beginning to have its effect. Loud huzzas filled the hall. These touching words had evoked wistful memories hidden deep in every heart. Old wounds were reopened and bled afresh again quimbleton had to call for silence i will recite to you he said a ditty that i have composed myself it is called a chanty of departed spirits in a voice tremulous with emotion he began the earth is grown puny and pallid the earth is grown gouty and gray for whiskey no longer is valid and wine has been voted away as for beer we no longer will swill it in riotous rollicking spree the little hot dogs in the skillet will have to be sluiced down with tea o oh, ales that were creamy like lather o oh, beers that were foamy like suds o oh, fizz that i loved like a father o oh, fie on the drinks that are duds i sat by the doors that were slatted and the stuff had a surf like the sea no vintage was anywhere vatted, too strong for a vetripotent me. I wallowed in waves that were tidal, but yet I was never unmoored, and after the twentieth sidle my syllables still were assured. I never was forced to cut cable, 
and drift upon perilous shores to get home i was perfectly able erect or at least on all fours although i was often some swiller i never was fuddled or bloused my hand was still firm on the tiller no matter how deep i caroused but now they have put an embargo on jazz juice that tingles the spine we can't even cozen a cargo of harmless old gooseberry wine but no legislation can daunt us the drinks that we knew never die their spirits will come back to haunt us and whimper and hover near by the spookists insist that communion exists with the souls that we lose and so we may count on reunion with all that's immortal of booze those spirits we loved have departed to some psychical twentieth plane but still we will not be downhearted we'll soon greet our loved ones again to lighten our drouth and our tedium whenever our moments would sag we'll call in a spiritist medium and go on a psychical jag as the frenzy of cheering died away quimbleton's face took on the glow of simple benignness that bleak had first observed at the time of the julep incident in the balloon office the flush of a warm impulsive idealism overspread his genial features it was the face of one who deeply loved his fellow men my friends he said now i am able to say in all sincerity here's how i have great honour in presenting to you my betrothed fiancee miss theodolinda chuff do not be startled by the name gentlemen miss chuff the daughter of our arch enemy is wholly in sympathy with us she is the possessor happily for us of extraordinary psychic powers i have persuaded her to demonstrate them for our benefit if you will follow my instructions implicitly you will have the good fortune of witnessing an alcoholic seance miss chuff very pale but obviously glad to put her spiritual gift at the disposal of her lover was escorted by the platform by bleak the editor had been coached beforehand by quimbleton as the routine of the seance the first requirement said quimbleton to the awestruck gathering is to put yourselves in the proper frame of mind for that purpose i will ask you all to stand up placing one foot on the rung of a chair kindly imagine yourselves standing with one foot on a brass rail you will then summon to mind with all possible accuracy and vividness the scenes of some bar-room which was once dear to you i will also ask you to concentrate your mental faculties upon some beverage which was once your favourite please rehearse in imagination the entire ritual which was once so familiar from the inquiring look of the bartender down to the final clang of the cash register a visualization of the old free lunch counter is also advisable all these details will assist the medium to trance herself bleak in the meantime had carried a small table on the platform and placed an empty glass upon it miss chuff sat down at this table and gazed intently at the glass quimbleton produced a white apron from somewhere and tied it round his burly form with bleak playing the role of customer he then went through a pantomime of serving imaginary drinks his representation of the now vanished type of the bartender was so admirably realistic that it brought tears to the eyes of more than one in the gathering the editor with appropriate countenance and gesture dramatized the motions of ordering drinking and paying for his invisible refreshment his pantomime was also accurate and satisfying evidently based upon gesture conveying the generous sentiment this one's on me the spinning coin on the bar the raising of the elbow the final toss that dispatched the fluid all these were done to the life the audience followed suit with a will a whispering rustle ran through the dingy hall as each man murmured his favorite catchwords give it a name set em up again here's luck and such archaic phrases were faintly audible miss chuff kept her gaze fastened on the empty tumbler suddenly her rigid pose relaxed she drooped forward in her chair with her head sunk and hands limp tenderly and reverently quimbleton bent over her then his face shining with triumph he spoke to the hushed watchers she is in the trance he said gentlemen her happy soul is in touch with the departed spirits what'll you have don't all speak at once fifty-nine in hushed voices petitioned for a bronx 
Quimbleton turned to the unconscious girl. Fifty-nine devotees, he said. Ask for the spirit of the Bronx cocktail vouchsafe his presence among us. Miss Chuff's slender figure stiffened again. Her hand went out to the glass beside her and raised it to her lips. Some of the more eagerly credulous afterwards asserted that they had seen a cloudy yellow liquid appear in the vessel, but it is not improbable that the wish was father to the vision. At any rate, the fifty-nine suppliants experienced at that instant a gush of sweet coolness down their throats, and the unmistakable subsequent tingle. They gazed at each other with a wild surmise. "'How about another?' said one in a thrilling whisper take your turn said quimbleton who's next one hundred and fifty-three nominated scotch whiskey the order was filled without a slip quimbleton's face beamed above his beard like a full-blown rose magnificent he whispered to bleak both of them having partaken in the second round if this keeps on we'll have a charge of the tight brigade the next round was ninety-five jack rose cocktails but the audience was beginning to get out of hand those who had not yet been served grew restive they saw their companions with brightened eyes and beaming faces comparing notes as to the delicious revival of old sensations in the impatience of some of the jubilation of others the psychic concentration flagged a little then just as quimbleton was about to ask for the fourth round the unforgivable happened someone at the back shouted a glass of buttermilk miss chuff shuddered quivered and opened her eyes with a tragic gasp she slipped from the chair and fell exhausted to the floor bleak ran to pick her up quimbleton screamed out an oath the spell is broken he roared there's a spy in the room at that instant a battalion of armed chuffs burst into the hall they carried a huge hose and in ten seconds a six-inch stream of cold water was being poured upon the bewildered psychic tipplers quimbleton and bleak seizing the girl's helpless form escaped by a door at the back of the platform heaven help us cried bleak distraught what shall we do this means the firing squad unless we can escape theodolinda feebly opened her eyes oh horrible she murmured the spirit of buttermilk i saw him he threatened me the horse cried quimbleton with fierce energy the bishop's horse in the stable they ran wildly to the rear quarters of the home where they found the bishop's famous charger whinnying in his stall all three leaped upon his back in the confusion amid the screams of the tortured inmates and the cruel cries of the invading chuffs they made good their escape every one of the wretched inmates captured at the psychic carouse was immediately sentenced to six months hard listening on the chautauqua circuit but even during this brutal punishment their memories returned with tenderest reminiscence to the experience of that afternoon as one of them said it was a real treat and although quimbleton had plainly stated the relation in which he stood to theodolinda chuff she had no less than two hundred and ten proposals of marriage by mail from those who had attended the seance End of chapter six